All right, thank you very much, ma'am. A uh, very good afternoon, uh, sir. Um, I will quickly introduce uh, Mr. Shahani to uh, all the participants uh, who are viewing this uh, webinar live right now. Mr. Shahani is a former vice chairman and managing director of Novartis India and a global business leader with over 40 years of experience with a consistent record of growth and creating sustained shareholder value in leading diverse businesses across geographies of Asia, Europe, Latin America, and India. So as, I know, as, as you see, uh, Mr. Shani has actually worked across uh, continents uh, and brings in that kind of diverse experience into the classroom today. Uh, he has also been the president of OPPI, SICC, and BCCI. He's a thought leader in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, uh, one very important thing that I would like to say is that uh, what you're going to hear is actually from the veteran of the industry. Uh, so over to you, uh, Mr. Shani, and I'm going to present your PPT as well. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm audible now? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, thank you, Aditya and Mr. Shani, for this uh, very warm welcome. I'm actually quite uh, overwhelmed by the diversity of uh, people who are attending this talk. And I hope I can cover a reasonable number of points during this half an hour that I have for presentation, followed by question and answers. The fact is, coronavirus, how does this name come around? You know, the virus actually has spiky projections on their surface, which look like crowns. And corona is a Latin word for crown, which is ironical because, you know, this is honestly and truly a crown of thorns, which is the whole world is wearing at the moment. It has already infected 4 million people worldwide, killed 275,000 already, and only out of this 4 million, just one fourth have actually got out of hospitals where they've been quarantined for a while. This has really overwhelmed all the health systems across the world in every country. It is something which has brought the economy to its knees it has quarantined billions of people across the world. And again, you know, nothing remains unsinged from the scourge. Everything it touches gets singed. Look at the most powerful and rich country in the world, US. It spends billions and billions on defense, but it ran out of 70 cent masks and it depend on other countries to send it masks. If you look at what is changing the habits of people, Online consultancy with doctors, which is ha happening at the moment, I think it is going to be here to stay. So waiting rooms in the doctor's clinics is going to be all away and you'll find ways of value exchange through online consultancy. Companies which are selling online, Amazon and the others, are going to dramatically increase sales, which means not only the size and shape of things you'll get there, but also the employment which generates. But again, if you look at uh, Technology companies, I mean, the big ones, of course, Google and Microsoft, but many of the startups, they are going to make the big difference in how we manage our life going ahead. So let's start the presentation. You know, if you look uh, here, the coronavirus, the question really is on the table is will pharma be the white knight? The fact is, today it's the ordinary soap and water which is helping us and sanitizing. There's nothing immediately in sight, which is a white knight at the moment, but we'll talk about it in a moment. It's actually a problem, non-parallel. It is something which we have not seen ahead. Next. Something which will remain for us for decades. So today, what are we going to talk about? I'll talk a bit about the history of pandemics, what the economic and business challenges, how it's impacting India, some prognosis, some of the clinical research is happening. What role can big pharma play in this? All the long-term complications, uncharted waters and some conclusion. But before I go to the next slide, right now I want to thank all the doctors, the healthcare workers, the hospitals and NGOs who are actually supporting the big challenge in front of us already. I know each one of us is doing our small thing in our own way, but these are the warriors who are really taking it head on at the expense of their own health. Next. So, you know, plagues have been with us since bib biblical times. 
But in those days, they did not know, they did not know science, and they used to call it the wrath of gods. There was the so-called plague of Justinian, which was way back in 541 CE. It actually killed 30 to 50 million people at that time, which is actually then half the population of the world. The question is, why did not the other half die? Because this is what we now know as herd humidity, which happened. Then in the more recent times, we are all familiar with the Asian flu, the swine flu, the Hong Kong flu, and a lot of these kill again, billions of people. Some of these are very dangerous flus. Avian flu actually was much more dangerous than coronavirus, if you say. It kills 75% of the people infected because if it moved from human to human, the results would have been catastrophic. Next. Some, uh, you know, iconic pictures of the five biggest pandemics in the country, which have been talked about a lot, the Great Plague of London, you know. All people were doing was sealing up the sick, staying away from the sick. Smallpox, which is one of the biggest scourges of the century. Thanks to vaccines, it got eliminated. Cholera, took them years to find out what cholera the cause was. Finally, they discovered it was back water. Next. So, you know, this is really a health and an economic challenge. So, therefore, it's a double whammy. It's health because it impacts everybody. It's economic because it creates a huge challenge. And again, what happens is when you have a lockdown, manufacturing goes down. It brings in lack of income. It brings in poverty. If you're poor, you fall sick. If you fall sick, you get poorer still. So there's this vicious cycle which is beginning to happen. And this is a phenomena in most of the developing countries. And finally, there's this ethical question. Can there be a trade-off between health and economics? Should we start the wheels of economy running and let people die? Or should we continue to quarantine? There are no clear answers. And some of the best brains in the world and countries are working on how to do a calibrated opening up which are the areas, how to manage supply chain, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Next. Look what's happening around the world. I mean, right, the American president in his own office, the healthcare secretary and the others have got COVID. The prime minister of the UK got COVID. And we had Canada, prime minister's wife got COVID. So this scourge does not leave anybody. There's no class distinction here. There's no border distinction. It does not need a passport to cross the border. It just arrives and that's a huge challenge. Next. These are familiar sites. I think many of you have seen these pictures. I know some of you, when we have gone there, we won't take the ideal picture of the Eiffel Tower or you know the Brandenburg Gate, where a thousand of tourists milling around you and you can't take a picture. But is this a picture we want? No, it's not. But this is going to continue for some time and we will see this isolation because what happens with this virus is it comes in spikes. The moment you open up, a spike will happen. Then you close down again, you open up until the vaccine is found. And we'll talk about that next. This is interesting. You know, a few weeks ago, IMS had forecast a negative GDP growth rate across major countries. Of course, they had put China and India still showing 1.2 and 1.9 percent growth rate. If you go to India, back in 1991, our GDP grew at 1.1 percent. So, in effect, we've been set back by 20 years as far as GDP grows. Today, in fact, last yesterday, Nomura has given a forecast that India will actually be at minus 5 percent growth. It's not 1.9 percent growth as the IMF forecast was IMS forecast was a few weeks ago, but this is the current situation. So it's pretty grim because if GDP growth remains as it is, economic activity is reduced and there'll be job losses, there'll be other challenges which we'll talk about in the Q&A. Next. So, you know, it's really both sides, the shock is there on the supply side as well as demand side. We all know factories have shut down. 
we all know labor shortage will persist for a while all the migratory labor has gone away to their villages to get them back will be a challenge we cannot run the factories at full scale even those which have started the moment uh, pharmaceuticals and many others are anywhere between 30 to 50 percent of the capacity a lot of the supply chain has been disrupted many large companies depend on small suppliers they don't have working capital so daily cash flow is a big problem again on the demand side there is this whole mental mindset that we should stop spending say for the rainy day so demand is going down we have loss in income and employment the whole sentiment is weakened up and there are you know multiple dimensions to this next so what's really happening in india we know these numbers and these numbers change every day this was just yesterday 122 million indians have lost their jobs look at the enormity of this this is twice the total population of uk uk is about 62 million can you imagine two uk's losing all their jobs this is something which we still have to come to grips with it's a big huge social problem 63000 cases of covid but it's interesting maharashtra alone has one third of these cases of which mumbai by itself is 10000 so metros are really the big red zones and if you take all of india which is divided into 773 zones 130 in the red zone which means economic activity in these will be limited is less than 20% but many of these are critical to run the economic engine of india running and be a while before they open up to normal uh, possibilities and we still don't know whether we've reached the peak pandemic as yet in india at the same time the health systems acute shortage of beds and hospitals i was hearing this morning in mumbai which is supposed to be the mecca of medical uh, treatment is really short of treatment for covid patients and if you go to smaller towns and cities you can imagine what bigger challenge you can face over there uh, next look at this i mean these are signs we see in the newspaper and the uh, tv channels this is a huge big problem it's a mental physical and a social problem and these are people they realize they have to do social distancing they realize they need a livelihood but look at them cooped up like hens and rushing back home this is going to cause a lot of problem going ahead could be some social unrest and we have to think back deeply how big corporates how the government how the ngos can come to aid of these more than 122 million people who have lost their livelihoods. Next. Next. So, you know, what's the prognosis? The fact is this pandemic could last 18 months to two years. And why am I saying that? I'll talk in a bit little about this on details, but there is no magic potion. There's no cure which is coming immediately uh, if you listen to the news channels they say tomorrow we're going to get a vaccine that's not true the fact also is this will be prolonged we had the financial crisis of 2008 2009 but that was economic crisis this is as i said both an economic crisis and a health and a medical crisis but on the other hand you know i've already mentioned new opportunities will emerge uh, for certain companies, certain kinds of businesses. The whole thing will be reoriented. Again, from the financial side, uh, companies who are doing poorly, there'll be MA opportunities. The private equity firms are going to look at this. And this could lead to better economies of scale, etc. But the real focus right now is to save lives. Next. So, what are companies really doing for business recovery the first thing is to protect which is your people your cash or uh, whatever you have immediately you need to manage better and smarter the second thing is recover you have to start up your plants carefully you have to recover last ground you have to try and uh, manage supply chains better 
and finally looking ahead way to retool it's going to be a different world a digital world there will be more collaboration even amongst competitors so it's a different way to look ahead next and again you know the world has changed profit cannot just be the goal and we'll talk about that a little bit on on our pricing later on unrelenting cutting fixed costs everybody has to start from zero based budgeting it is not that what we spent last year we can increase expenses by another 5% 10% we have to totally rework and retool supply chain and business for the new order next so what's happening currently you know everybody's seen this in the papers and i've said that these are options on the table but honestly these not all of these are really options in the real sense people are talking home remedies now you know some of these are palliatives as far as home remedies is concerned you know herbal therapies uh, teas essential oils tinctures a lot of them being used homeopathy you know the ministry of ayush had recommended arsenium album 30 on an empty stomach for 3 days now none of this has been proved as yet camphor which is good in many ways as supplement along with vitamin c and vitamin d for building up immunity but these are not cures even the famous hydrochloroquine hcq which has been dramatically increased in production we still don't have full large scale clinical trials which prove that this is a cure gilead's remdesivir this also is something where uh, phase 3 clinical trials are going on as yet and we'll talk a bit about it more when we talk about the pharma industry next you know we must remember now just to look cast our by eye a little back pharma research has addressed some of humanity's biggest health challenges just to remind everybody you know when alexander the great was around life expectancy for people was only 23 years then came clean drinking water it became 46 years and then came pharma industry and health knowledge it turned to 80 85 years so the industry has reimagined medicine it has really changed the way we look at cancer alzheimers liver disease cardiovascular diseases uh, cancer for example leukemia now novartis and i've worked with novartis so i'm saying that clearly uh, created a drug called glivec it's a pill you take the pill your cancer is in remission this is for chronic myeloid leukemia in the old days if you had cml it was a death sentence in 6 months but now people have been living for 20 years with cml and going about their normal life so pharma industry has done a lot we talked about polio we talked about smallpox all this is a result of pharma industry and research which takes a lot of money time and science behind it next this is a very important slide i want to spend a minute on this and this is all about clinical trials now you know clinical trials are part of the research and development process of pharma industry if you see the first top part research and development research will take about 30% of the pharma time and 30% of the cost and development of a drug will take 70% of the balance time and 70% of the cost and a large amount is spent on clinical trial in research if you look at the bottom you start off with 100000 leads and come out with one drug at the end of it at the end of 12 to 15 years that's how long it takes normally to man to research a new breakthrough drug and these clinical trials they are basically multi centered placebo controlled randomized double blind studies I'll very carefully listen to that this is not a very simple thing first you test it on animals check the efficacy and safety then you check them on healthy human beings then on larger number so all these go around what we call phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 and finally you also do post marketing safety as you know many of the drugs are launched but a year or two or three later you find some other reaction taking place so a lot of this goes in post marketing surveillance so clinical trials are a very important part of any drug development and that is why 
when there is so much noise on these TV channels that vaccines will be delivered and made in six months, uh, it's a big and a tall order. And I hope something happens, magic, because all the world's minds are together, all the technologies together, and need to see how to deal with this. Next. So basically, the current research on COVID is really rapidly zeroing around three areas. One is diagnostics, that is rapid diagnostic and accurate, accurate diagnostics, whether you've got COVID, because very often testing can give you false positive or false negative results. So treatment, again, elevating symptoms, lowering overall mortality rates. So for example, HCQ, when we talked of that, that's not a cure, but I think if you take it at the early stages of COVID, it reduces your hospitalization costs. So there is research going on in that as well. And finally, the big one, vaccines. This is really what will prevent transmission by making populations immune to COVID-19. Now, for example, there's a theory floating around that Indians have not taken BCG uh, across the board in the country, but many European countries haven't taken this. And therefore, the immunity there is low and therefore there are more deaths and more widespread COVID there than in India. But you know, these are all theories, not fully proved as yet. Next. Well, I mentioned this already, the power of technology. This is going to be a very potent element in drug discovery, digital. For example, you know, when we do clinical trials, we have hundreds and petabytes of data, which is lying with uh, what we call as uh, organizations which do clinical trials for us. And we just take away what is relevant to the drug under discussion and discovery. And we leave behind a whole bunch of data with them. But we've realized that if you mine this data very digitally and carefully, you could discover some other elements and drugs which are there, which have been left behind. So there are a lot of orphan drugs or drugs where discoveries not be made. So a lot of this is going to be re-harnessed all over again as you go in the future. Next. Well, the big question is Big Pharma giving the white knight? The fact is we have over 100 vaccine candidates in development across the world, out of which only 10 have reached clinical testing stage. Even if these come to fruition, whenever it does, we have to manufacture on an enormous scale. Now these manufacturing capacities are not built, they're not ready. So you have to build an advanced capacity, anticipating that this vaccine will be ready and you'll make it. So billions of doses have to be made on this. And finally, again, you'll have a huge distribution challenge globally. And the key question is, what is affordable pricing? Is 10 rupees a vaccine affordable or 100 rupees or 1,000 rupees? How do we cross subsidize this? We'll come to all that. So what is happening today? among some of the collaborations, there are many there happening there. But look at this, Sanofi and GSK, these are arch rival. They've partnered now. They've partnered for clinical trials, combining the might, the technological might, and the monetary might to try and see if we can crack and get a vaccine. And the earliest, they hope the clinical trials is only in quarter three, 2020. So this is clinical trials. Then they have to go through phase one, phase two, phase three. And they're expecting that if successful, then only in quarter three, 2021, which is quite some way the vaccine will be available from these big giants. Again, Pfizer has partnered with BioNTech. You know, smaller biotech companies are nimble footed, they're smart, and there is an expectation, which is pretty good, that there'll be a vaccine in quarter four, 2020. Let's see. JNJ has committed a huge amount, one billion, just for COVID vaccine research. Now this is uh, probably 15% of their total research budget for all the products that they do research across the world. So it's a huge amount. And again, they have a strong expectation of vaccine in quarter 21. Novartis along with some companies are collaborating with the National Institute of Health USA because here we need also government to collaborate with their laboratories, our technical prowess to see whether we can come with something. They haven't given a date or deadline. Again, Serum Institutes, it's an amazing institute 
uh, Poonamala's in Pune, they produce 1.75 billion doses of vaccine. 60% of the vaccine across the world is made by them. They've combined with Oxford to look at research in this collaboration. Finally, the European group, I mean, Brexit or another what notwithstanding and their fights on you know free trade agreements, they have pledged jointly 8.3 billion for unprecedented global cooperation. Okay, next. So we got a video to show. At a time when things are most uncertain, we turn to the most certain thing there is, science. Science can overcome diseases, create cures, and yes, beat pandemics. It has before, it will again. Because when it's faced with a new opponent, it doesn't back down. It revs up, asking questions till it finds what it's looking for. That's the power of science. So we're taking our science and unleashing it. Our research, experts, and resources, all in an effort to advance potential therapies and vaccines. Other companies and academic institutions are doing the same. The entire global scientific community is working together to beat this thing. And we're using science to help make it happen. Because when science wins, we all win. Okay. So in India, again, you know, we have quite a few initiatives. I've mentioned Serum Institute. Uh, it's supplying currently vaccine to 147 countries. It's also done a collaboration apart from Oxford University with Corigenics. And they expect a vaccine in quarter one, 2022, which is some time away. Zydus Kedilla has actually made indigenous COVID-19 test kits. We have global companies like Roche and uh, Thermo Fisher. They already have these equipment and they've imported many in India. They're rapid testing. Uh, then also IPCA and Zyrus Kedilla, they have ramped up their high HCQ supplies dramatically. They make about 35 crore tablets a year now, of which 10 crores have been kept for India and the balance have been exported to global companies. Novartis, for example, has donated 130 million doses of HCQ to WHO. Again, you know, certain drugs, there's a drug uh, which Cipla and Orbindo make, it's ivermectin. This was for parasitic infection. Now it's possible to repurpose many of these old drugs for COVID. As we know, the examples of many drugs which are only designed for a certain illness, but they found they were in good use for others as well. So there's a lot of repurposes going on. And just day before yesterday, IIT Delhi alumni, they launched India's first COVID test bus uh, to test COVID-19. And this is at the reduced cost by 80% compared to conventional cost. So this can go from place to place from, uh, you know, uh, if you have to go to Dharavi, you can go there and test uh, out. Okay, next one. Okay, that's another short video. Well, it's a three minute video. Let's see if it plays.
so you know it is amazing what india has done in the past for healthcare in the world in the us 42% of the generic drugs sold come from india at a fraction of a cost so therefore it's not inconceivable that if we make the breakthrough in the vaccines that also will be show, sold as a fraction of a cost the fact is today we are starting research based on experience as you saw uh, experience on science from sars outbreak from mers outbreak and there's a lot of scientific insights already there and there is a strong knowledge of downstream inflammatory pathways to build upon next so you know the most important thing is immune modulation there this is boosting the body's immune system and this is also based on the fact that a lot of vaccine uh, re reduces the viral load by inhibiting its entry and blocking its entries so there are various various ways and pathways in which vaccines research is happening and this is a technical so I won't go into it but be that as may that there's a lot of work going on across the world a lot of technical minds are together a lot of money is being going putting to there and we hope to get some sucker there as far as pharma industry is concerned next unfortunately covid also has potential long term complication or uh, whether it's heart failure because it can cause uh, diabetes hypertension impaired lung function also causes uh, kidney problems renal insufficiency exocrine insufficiency is uh, not being able to digest food properly neuropsychiatric impact you know depression etc is a big big issue anxiety which is a result of uh, this whole problem so there are other challenges health problems you have to take care of it it's just not the covid infection next so these are really choppy uncharted waters you know if there's a ship on an ocean and it's calm up with the tide it goes up down with the tide it goes down but if it's choppy you don't know whether there's a whirlpool coming or there's a hurricane coming and all these current events are non linear events they are interconnected we're not sure what one will lead to the other and what accelerates and the question is about government policy it can only minimize the damage it cannot offset because we had a long time across the world preparing for this we have to listen to science the scientists have been saying for a long time that this virus or a virus will come but nobody had put money behind it the question is should private industry have put money behind it or should government have put money behind it that's up for debate but we have to listen to science next and finally as i have already said the behavior change will be irreversible work from home college online you saw tcs 75% of their 450000 people they have already said will work from home that is a huge impact on real estate people are just learning to adjust how to manage their time how to work from home how to learn online but the fact is our spirit is up we are up for a fight we want to support people who are impacted by this we want to support business we want to expand treatment and testing there's a lot which we can do so i'd like to leave this on a positive note although next slide we at the moment don't have a clear finishing line i hope it comes soon right as we put this presentation down there are people working very hard on that so now i'm open for q and a aditya yes uh thank you so much uh, sir i think uh, that was very insightful uh, to add on to that that finishing line seems like a marathon because we can always kind of see the finishing line but uh, we don't know when do we get there uh from but we there, have to keep uh, passing the baton huh? on the marathon yes, we have to keep passing the sure. baton yes for sure uh so i have a couple of questions and i'll take them up one by one um uh, yes so question number 1 um what are the risks associated with india being dependent on china for apis uh, and this is because since india largely depends on china nearly 70% by value has become a significant threat to india's healthcare manufacturing and global supply chain 
so what are the risks associated with this sir so i think this question has come into stark relief now during this period of covid crisis where it was building up for many years and unfortunately this is a result of some government policies started off in the 1980s and 1990s what government did was they introduced very draconian price control measures so for example manufacturers of apis or manufacturers of penicillin the price control was so strong that they started to make a cash loss so if i'm a commercial company a listed company and you're my shareholder you will ask me why do you continue to make a product which is making cash losses i want a fair return on my investment so one by one these plants closed down and china was waiting with open arms to manufacture them and over the last 15 to 20 years they developed an expertise in this and i used to in my meetings with the government i was a president of the pharma industry association i used to always tell them i said sir china does not need to nuke india to kill people they have to just shut off our pension and supply and millions of people will die in india but it was a short sighted effect they realize it now in fact the government's own pharma unit idpl which had the capacity to make apis and penicillin they themselves closed it down so it's come back chickens have come back to roost now the government is saying that we'll create some special zones and plug and play can you pharma industry come back and start making it now it will happen it will take time but for the moment we are still dependent and in fact in the recent past after covid i have been talking to some pharma people china has already raised prices partly it's uh, because some of their own plants were shut but pa- partly also they're taking advantage all right uh, i forgot to mention but that question was from uh, richa from our mbe batch uh, the second question is uh, pharma companies are accused of profiteering what should be the pricing for covid-19 drug you know first of all i don't like the word profiteering profits is legitimate profiteering is not pharma companies are needed by everybody but liked by very few and i can understand that because people expect mentally to get pharmaceuticals free or healthcare free uh, i'm saying this in the extreme as a word the fact is that pharmaceutical companies do spend huge amounts on research and this research has to have some payback otherwise there will be no investments made for drugs for our children and our children's children the question is how do you manage the pricing now one way of managing the pricing is to cross subsidize that means the rich pay more and the poor so poor pay nothing so if we have a distribution system by the government or otherwise where we can have this separation made out easily pharma companies can easily do that but for example in india we've not been able to do that again in india uh we don't have a reimbursement system it is all self pay uh there are very limited insurance so it is very painful for people to pay for pharmaceuticals and healthcare but equally it's also a fact that the odd pharma company or the odd entrepreneur has done what we call price gouging and sometimes as a generic drug which is off patent they have increased prices so as they say one bad apple spoils the whole brood you know so this has also happened but we have to find it's not the cost of the medicine it's the value of the medicine how much does the medicine give economic life to you how much the medicine keep you out of hospital so one must measure those aspects as well and many pharma companies have methods they have uh, 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 what you call uh, donation programs uh, they have public private partnership they have tiered pricing for example most pharma companies sell the highest priced drugs in the us second highest in europe then there's a the asia pricing and there's a the india pricing so there is some thing which is happening but it's still not enough for the bottom of the pyramid which we have in india all right uh, the next question uh, again comes from the mbe batch uh, his name is jeff with no vaccine in sight and the lockdown expected to be lifted with rising cases what could be the possible end game the government has in mind that's a, that's a question the government should answer but honestly i think the government has a tough call to make 
as I said earlier, it's between lives and livelihoods. The fact is the vaccine is going to take some time. Now, if the government had not done some degrees of lockdown, we would have had huge spikes in coronavirus and many, many people would have died. And as you saw, most countries have been able to do the lockdowns and open up slowly. The challenge with India is our coffers are not full. The government, for example, in the US and Europe have released trillions of dollars to support health economy. Now, I know Prime Minister went on TV yesterday and he has announced some measures. The question is, are these measures and the scale of these good enough to jumpstart the economy? This time will tell us. But we have a huge challenge and I think it will be a calibrated opening up. Certainly, as I said in my talk earlier, the red zones, we have a tough time. But many of the red zones also critical nodes and hubs for supply chain. So how do we manage this? And again, uh, even during the lockdown, I must say, most of the government states, health is a state subject, most of the states did not prepare very rapidly for this whole outage which will happen when the healthcare crisis takes place. All right. Um, I think this question is very much uh, relevant with the video that we just showed. Um, does India have the R&D infrastructure to develop a vaccine for COVID-19? So I, I want to put this in two parts. One is India has not been re doing research for decades overall compared to what other pharma companies do globally. And there's one reason for it because India had abolished a product patent law in 1970 and only in 1995 it came back but that also in a very diluted way so there was no incentive for people to put money in research because they could copy drugs and make money it's only more recently that some of the leading indian pharma companies have started to put money in research now just to give you a ratio global companies spend anywhere between 15 to 18% of their top line on research. Now this translates per company to billions of dollars. Novartis spends $8 billion a year annually on research. Pfizer spends seven or eight, J and J seven or eight. Now you know, the whole of pharma industry turnover in India is $20 billion. So how, look at the scale of investment required in research. Now of course the research costs in India will be significantly lower than what there is abroad. So even if you say it is one tenth, but it's a huge investment, and we still haven't got that scale of investments being put in research. So uh, Serum Institute is doing some great work, Zydus Kedilla, Glenmark, uh, Sun Pharma. I think many Lupin, many of them are doing some great work in research, and I'm quite sure we'll see some breakthrough. Once these breakthroughs come, it'll spur, spur more money in research, and even investors will come in and put fund research. All right. Uh, one very relevant question uh, is to the supply chain. So what has been the impact of the COVID-19 on pharma supply chain and how is India responding to it? This also comes from our ND batch. Her name is Sneha. Yes, Sneha. So, you know, it's a complicated situation, unfortunately. Most big pharma or many of the big manufacturing companies also supply a lot on small scale guys to supply the intermediates part of the supply chain. Now, many of these are in different states. For example, you take Baddi in Himachal Pradesh. A lot of pharma uh, uh, outsourcing is done from there. Now, these are completely locked up. So there is a breakdown in supply chain, which is slowly building up. For example, uh, two states uh, on the north uh, east of India supply 14% of the truck drivers of India all together. I saw the data somewhere. Now, these are closed. Now, if the truck drivers are not there, who will drive the trucks from uh, north to south? So there's a breakdown. Now, this is going to slowly build up. That is why most of the plants are at 30 to 50% of the capacity. Not only that, they cannot come to 100% capacity because of social distancing. So all the manufacturing units, uh, whether they are transporting their people, whether they are in the manufacturing sites, have to have limited number of people. So if you add all that together, it's going to take quite some time, uh, not minimum, at the minimum other six months before the supply chain builds up to some reasonable level. 
All right. Till then, I think till then you can expect some shortage of some drugs. I can't say which drug and which company, but uh, even today, I'm sure if you're going to the pharmacies, uh, many of the drugs, for example, HCQ was just not available. Everybody had stocked right. it up. Right. So I think we'll take one last question, uh, just because the time constraint that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, the one last question is, what lessons have we learned from this pandemic? Well, I think one of the biggest lessons uh, we've learned from this is not listening to science. Uh, the scientists have been saying that for the last six, seven, eight years, that something like this is going to strike us big time. So neither did the pharmaceutical companies listen to this, nor did the governments. The question is, is it the onus on the governments or the pharma companies? That's up for debate. Secondly, one of the lessons we've learned is, you know, all this inventory management just in time everything is just in time low working capital low cost now whether it's companies or whether it's governments they've kept just in time stocks now today when a pandemic like this comes to play you don't have masks you don't have ventilators uh, you don't have manufacturing capacities everything is just in time so supply chain breaks down so i think just in time is also very important to review this and the third thing is, of course, is about social being and get, getting togetherness. I think physical, mental and social well-being are things for review, which everybody must look at. This is, whole thing has caused a lot of stress with individuals. How do you manage it? What about mindfulness? What about yoga and exercise? And how do you remain connected with people to go through the crisis? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of the Q&A round. Uh, there are a couple of other questions that are coming in, but I think we can take them uh, offline. Uh, Mr. Shani will be happy to answer them offline. Uh, thank you very much once again uh, for all the um, you know insightful uh, sort of facts and figures that you showed up. And also uh, that covered a wide array of uh, the entire pharma industry, uh, very much relevant to all the business students and our parents and all the other guests uh, that are here. Uh, uh, I think we've come to an end to the main